Good afternoon. <laughs> it's a joy to welcome you in Christ's name to our midday Holy Week worship service today. It is our joy to welcome Pastor Tammy Coleman with Hanson United Methodist, and they are also offering special music here with us today. I know it's a, a busy week for you all, and I appreciate it so much, and I truly am grateful for all our Christian brothers and sisters that we can just take time to worship together, to remember our common witness as the body of Christ, and to be the church in the world. And it is a joy to welcome you all here today. And, and let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, as we come into this space in this time of worship now, we ask that you might open our hearts, still our minds, quiet any restlessness within us, and to take a moment to remember this day, this week we call holy, and the journey Christ makes. We thank you for this time together to worship, to be your church in the world, and we pray your blessings upon this time of worship. Amen. Amen. You will need your hymnals as we sing number 196, Go to Dark Gethsemane. Go to dark Gethsemane, all who feel the tempter's power, your Redeemer's conflict see, watch with him one bitter hour, turn not from his griefs away, learn of Jesus. Jesus Christ to pray. Follow to the judgment hall, view the Lord of life arraign. All the wormwood and the gall, all the pangs his soul sustained. Shun not suffering, shame, or loss. Learn of him to bear the cross. Calvary's mournful mountain climb, there adoring at his feet. Mark that miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete. It is finished, hear the cry, learn of Jesus Christ to die. Early hasten to the tomb where they laid his breathless clay. All is solitude and gloom who has taken him away. Christ is risen, he meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to rise. Thank you, BC. I invite you to join with me in the reading of the gospel coming from the gospel of John. This is the 13th chapter beginning with the 21st verse. And it says this, Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciples, the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. And Simon Peter motioned to him and asked, Who is he talking about? Is that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? 
Jesus responded, It is the one whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. When, Jesus, when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him, and then Jesus told him, Hurry and do what you're going to do. And none of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was the treasurer, some thought that Jesus was telling him to go and to pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. And as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the, man, for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks that your word speaks to us. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we, cut, we pray, Lord, that you would illuminate our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a confession to make, and I hope you won't judge me too much when I say what I'm going to say. But I love Hallmark movies. I can tell maybe some of, some of you also love Hallmark movies. There's something about them. I know they're cheesy. I know they're predictable. I know it's the same plot line that basically happens. A couple meets. They don't like each other. They have to spend time together for one reason or another. They end up falling in love, and then there's a conflict. One has betrayed the other in some way. They haven't been honest about who they are or what they're called to do. And, uh, and something happens, and they fall apart, but then they realize their deep love for one another, and they come back together, and they live happily ever after. Often, I want stories to have the happily ever after. I want the hallmark ending in life. And that doesn't happen does it all the time and in the story that I just read there's not the hallmark ending in fact it's deeply troubling the story this passage in scripture in fact that's how John describes Jesus's spirit Jesus was deeply troubled of course he's deeply troubled one of his friends will betray him. This story is sandwiched in between Jesus coming to his disciples, kneeling before them, and the lowest act of a servant washing their feet. This story is followed by his teaching, these last-minute instructions in the upper room, the last things he wants the disciples to know before he goes to the cross. It's like a, a parent... In the last moments before they leave on a trip, telling the caregiver all the things that need to be done to care for the child. And here, in between, is a story of betrayal. And it is deeply troubling. I think it's deeply troubling for us to read for a couple of reasons. One is because we are like the disciples and we say, who is it? Who is it, Lord, that will betray you whenever he makes that declaration? And in fact, Matthew says that the disciples were also deeply troubled. And it wasn't that they were asking, who is it necessarily? But the question, is it I, Lord? Is it I? They began to reflect could they be the one that betrays Jesus? You know, betrayal is a strong word, isn't it? It means to be harmed by one that we trusted, either intentionally or unintentionally. Betrayal occurs when one shares a piece of confidential information with someone else that they weren't supposed to. Betrayal happens 
when one is disloyal in the relationship, when one is unfaithful, when one turns their back, maybe says an untruth. Betrayal is the highest form of breach in a relationship, whether it's between friends or family members or even spouses. Have you known the pain of betrayal? Of one that you have trusted, that you have confided in, and then they, whether intentionally or unintentionally, broke that trust. Broke that relationship. Maybe you've been the betrayer. Maybe you've been the one who has been disloyal or broken confidence or been unfaithful. That evening, the question lingered, Is it I, Lord? Is it I? The disciples searched their own souls and they found themselves to be capable of that betrayal. In fact, they all did betray Jesus in their own way, except for John. For every disciple, Judas is the one who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But it was Peter who denied him that he ever knew him three times. The disciples, when Jesus were arrested, they scattered, they got afraid, and they ran behind closed doors, and they stayed there until Easter morning. In the darkest hours of Jesus' suffering and death, his friends were nowhere to be found. They each turned their back on him. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? We would love to believe that we are above betrayal. That we are above what the disciples did. That our faith is stronger knowing on the other side of the resurrection. That we are able to live differently. And yet we know that we are guilty of denying Jesus. Instead of denying our selfishness. We take up our comfort seats. Instead of taking up the cross. And we choose to follow the world instead of choosing to follow him. Is it I, Lord? This deeply dis disturbs us because we recognize our own betrayal. Second reason of this passage deeply d disturbs us and troubles us is not just that we are the betrayer and have betrayed God and each other, in our actions and our thoughts, but also how Jesus responds to his betrayer. He knew that Judas was about to give him up, and yet, what did he do? He knelt in front of Judas and he cleaned his feet. And then he took bread and he dipped it into the cup and he gave it to him. This was the act of deep friendship, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. I think that disturbs us, that Jesus would treat his betrayer that way. Because you know how I would treat him? Probably the same you would. I would put up a wall. I would keep Judas at arm's length. I would I wouldn't ignore him. So that when the betray betrayal happens, the pain would be lessened. It wouldn't hurt so deeply. But not Jesus. He loved Judas unconditionally without strings attached. We tend to put conditions on our love, and yet Jesus shows what true love is by not only willing to wash his betrayer's feet, to have supper with him, but also to go to the cross for his sin and for ours. 
I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's quote about love, where he said this, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure to keep it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But it will change in that safe and dark and motionless and airless casket. It will not be broken, but become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. I think that's what disturbs us about this passage, is Jesus shows Judas a vulnerable kind of love that was unconditional. We wish this was in a Hallmark movie where everything works out at the end, but we know for Judas it doesn't. But for you and I today, we have the hope that we have a Savior who is able to come when we have been the betrayer, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and we realize how our actions have been hurtful to someone else. And he comes and he kneels at our feet. And he tenderly and lovingly and compassionately washes away our sin. And then he takes the bread of deep friendship and he offers to restore us again. And when we have been the one who has been betrayed and the pain is raw, he comes alongside of us and he says, I know what that feels like. I know what that is. And I have given you what you need in order to heal. And friends, that is the good news for today. Let us pray. We are grateful, O oh God, for Jesus, who teaches us, even in the midst of betrayal and hurt and pain, what it is like to offer love and grace and forgiveness. We pray, O oh God, that you would Come and heal our hearts in the ways that we have betrayed and the ways that we've been betrayed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
before we close in prayer, I want to remind you that um, all are welcome to stay for lunch. You can take, uh, go through the line out there and get your food and sit and eat and fellowship with friends here. But if you need to head back to work and life, you're welcome to take your lunch to go. Let's close in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your grace, for a Savior who chose to wash feet instead of throw stones. God, we thank you for his mercy and grace in our lives. And as we eat this food today, may it nourish us and strengthen us, continue to be your people in the world. In Christ's name, amen. We invite to stand for a closing song. Go, my children, sins forgiven at peace and pure. Here you learned how much I love you, what I can cure. Here you heard my son's dear story. Here you touched him, saw his glory. Go, my children, sins forgiven, at peace and pure.